I realize some of you don't know me, but others of you who do know me may find it surprising that I am really excited. I mean, excited about today's Bible study. Now, it's today here, right there in the morning somewhere else. I don't know where you are watching this, but I am excited about today's Bible study. The reason for that is because today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to be focusing on three things in the next three studies we have together that I'm going to direct, okay? So I've been asked to share with you some ideas to challenge you, and while I study and prepare for this, <laughs> I'm being challenged myself to rethink, to re-examine, to review things and also to draw out new things that I've never seen in scripture before. And so I, I'm excited. I'm excited because we're gonna be looking at these three things, location, identity, and blessings, all from Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna camp here the next few times we spend together. And so let's look at Ephesians chapter one, beginning in verse one. Now this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians in Ephesus, and I'm not gonna go into great detail except to say that Paul's time with the Christians in Ephesus, he spent three years in Ephesus. That's about the longest of any record recorded time that Paul spent anywhere. And to, to devote himself to three years in this city, to reach to the people with the gospel of Jesus and to help those who become Christians to grow up in the Lord, to make a full conversion and learn what does it mean to walk with Jesus in every area of your life. That's what this letter is all about. There are three major principles in the entire letter. And the first is love, the next is power, and the third is the Holy Spirit. And out of love, power, and the Holy Spirit, we learn how to live individually. We learn how to build healthy, lasting, meaningful, loving relationships with other people. Just about every kind of relationship you can have with anyone is described in this letter, and we're given instruction as to how to live with each other. But there's also instruction as to how to conduct battle against the spiritual forces of wickedness. And that's why I think it's important for us to spend some time diving in deeply into the letter to the Ephesians. Now, you remember, if you look back at the book of Acts and you see Paul's time in Ephesus, you'll remember that there was a time when so many people turned to the Lord, they began bringing their books of black arts and magic into the town square and burning them publicly. Thousands and thousands of dollars worth of books were burned because these people were making a clear turnaround to follow Jesus and away from the spiritual forces of wickedness that had been at work in their life and is at work in the city of Ephesus. It's interesting to me that this is one of two letters that I'm aware of where the Apostle Paul deals directly with how to do battle against the spiritual forces of wickedness. The other is in, found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we may look at that sometime in the future. But important, at the end of this letter on page 6, Paul talks about our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies. What do you mean in the heavenlies? I thought that's where we are in Christ. It is where we are in Christ. We are located in Christ who is in the heavenlies, but that's also where the spiritual warfare is taking place against the spiritual forces of wickedness. And I, I hope that by the end of our study through Ephesians, and I realize I'm not going to be conducting a study on a regular basis for a period of time. I'm going to be coming in once or twice a month and leading you into some Bible study that I hope is going to be beneficial for you. So let's, let's not take any more time with me just rambling about what I see and what I think. Let's read the Word of God together. And before we do that, could we take just a moment and pray? Holy Spirit, we pray that you will give us guidance into what you have written in this book through the Apostle Paul. As we evaluate 
Ephesians and take out of this letter that was written to them at that time in their life that you would help us to take out of that, extrapolate, to bring out of that letter things that are important for us to understand so that we can live more closely to you individually, so that we can improve in our relationships with each other and with other people in our community, and so that we can fight more powerfully and with greater purpose and clarity the spiritual forces of wickedness that are working in our community, even within our church, even within our own lives, that we can stand strong and victoriously as we admit our own weakness and depend upon you for all of our weapons and our power. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us not only your life on the cross, but you give us your life every day while we walk with you and in you and help us to see that more clearly because of our time together today. And in Jesus, it's in your name that we pray these things and to your glory. Amen. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1. What I want to do is emphasize our location. Now, I say, where are you right now? Some of you are saying, well, I'm in the Philippines, and you're telling me I'm in Bacolod, or I'm in uh, maybe, I don't know where you are in the world watching this video right now. It could be in Georgia. It could be in Oklahoma. It could be in Arkansas. It could be in Idaho, in the United States. You might be in Switzerland. You might be in Germany. I don't know where you are located physically. My, the most important question is not where are you physically, but where are you located spiritually. Read with me and pick up where you are spiritually. And the way I want us to do that is I'm going to leave out specific words in this part of the letter. The first page of this letter will, will be so significant that you know where you are. And if you know where you are, and you know who you are, and you know what you have, you can live a more effective life in Jesus, can't you? I, I, th I think you can. Let's, let's see if that's right or not, okay? So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in... Now, when I see... Christ Jesus, or I see Jesus, or in Him, I'm going to leave that out. I'm just going to say in and pause. And I want you to see the words in your own Bible. So if you don't have your Bible right now, let me tell you, you're going to need your own Bible and you're going to open it up to page um, 1765. Ephesians 1, the first page of this letter, and we're going to read it line by line. And I'm going to leave out certain words to emphasize our location. So go back with me. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in with every spiritual blessing in even as He chose us in before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before in love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in in we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in things in heaven and things on earth in 
we have obtained an inheritance having predestined according to, or having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his will, to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in might be to the praise of his glory. In you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, that's good news, of your salvation, and believed in, were sealed with the, whole, with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I just want to say hallelujah at the end of that reading because that is so challenging and encouraging and hopeful and helpful. Did you notice the location? Did you see more clearly than ever before where you are? See, if you're a Christian, you may be physically located in a particular room, in a particular building, in a city, in a, in, on an island or in a country, but spiritually there is a reality that is beyond the physical and i want you to see that let me draw that on the on the uh, board here let's let this represent the person of jesus all right so this is going to be jesus and this is going to be you or me here we are all messed up and here's Jesus, the perfect one. If you were to describe a relationship that Jesus has with God on a scale of one to 10, what would you say that it is? Now think hard. On a scale of one to 10, what is the relationship that Jesus, okay, okay, I hear you. It's a 10, now actually his relationship is beyond a 10. It is absolutely perfect. There is nothing between Jesus and the Father. Are you with me on that? He has the perfect relationship with God. Now, look at me. Here's my life without Jesus. What is my relationship with God? On a scale of 1 to 10, if Jesus is not in my life. Think hard. You're right. It's a zero. I don't even have a one point relationship with God, do I? Because without Jesus, I don't have any relationship with God. Sin has ruined my life. So Jesus says, look, I died on a cross. I was buried and I was raised again so that I continue to live Jesus Christ is alive. Are we agreed on that? Jesus is alive. All right. Jesus is alive and he is powerful above all. I think he's quite happy. That's why I did what I did. So he tells me, I want you to trust me. Tr 
trust my death and burial and resurrection will give you life. Now, I can't fully explain this. I, I, I explain what little bit I understand in the last Bible study. And if you didn't watch that, you can go back on YouTube or you can go back to McCullough Church website, YouTube, and find that particular teaching. And I think I explain, at least to some degree, it, it makes sense in my little mind, how God can use the death of Jesus to pay for every person's penalty of sin throughout all of history. Okay, so he died, he was buried, and he rose again. He asked me and you to do the same thing he did. I need to die to this way of life. Actually, look at this. I'm already dead, aren't I? I'm dead in my sin. <laughs> sin killed me. Spiritually, it, killed, it separates me from God. And so I need to be connected to life. And God is life. God is love. God is holiness. God is, God is power. God is justice. God is all of those things together. He, he is those things. Okay, so I think that's why he said, you tell them my name is I am. And there is no explanation after that. Just I am. Because God's am is everything about whatever it is that he is. I don't know that I understand what I just said, but I think it's important that we, that we believe it. Okay, so I'm dead in my sin. Sin has killed me. But Jesus commands me, if you want life, you need to follow me. Why would I want to follow Jesus? Because nobody has ever loved me like Jesus loves me. Nobody has ever wanted to give me life and to give me himself like Jesus wants to give me everything about himself. Nobody has ever loved me, considers me valuable like Jesus does. Nobody, nobody is committed to me as much as Jesus the Christ. And the same is true for you. You are the most important to him. He loves you. You're valuable. You're so valuable, he said, I'll pay whatever it costs to have a relationship with you. That's okay, that tells me how much I'm worth to you. How much am I worth to you, Jesus? And Jesus says, you are worth my life. Nobody has ever loved me that much. You know, I love him back. I wanna live for the man who loves me that much and gives his life for me and to me because he was not only died for me but he was buried and three days later his body was raised from the dead and he is still alive that's bible truth and i stake my life on it so have you so he says i want you to die to this way of life don't live in sin anymore it killed you don't live this way anymore die to that way of life be buried that's what baptism is. It's a burial with Christ and be raised in, aha, there it is, in Christ. So here I am in Jesus. He has placed his Holy Spirit in me. Things have changed now. My location, the most important, the most important fact of Scripture, I believe, your spiritual location has changed. You have moved from death to life because Jesus is, listen to me, this is what he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is life. He's not just life giving, he is life. Are you following what I'm saying? Without Jesus, you have no life. I have no life without Jesus. So I've left death and come into life, but you see, my behavior is not perfect. As I grow, I'm gonna get more and more like him. I'm gonna become more and more 
like Jesus so that hopefully by the time, maybe I'm in my 90s if I live that long, you're actually gonna look at me and say, oh, I see you are becoming more and more like Jesus in every way, even from your heart. That's my goal. I wanna be like Jesus in every way because you see, he is teaching me how to live and how to love like him. Now, I don't have to do that so that he will accept me. He has accepted me and then given me power so that I can do that. And by the way, this is how we are designed to live. But you've got to change your location. And once you change your location, you need to understand where you are. Now, go back and read this page again with me. I'm going to highlight a couple things. I want you to see this. Number one, look back at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Why is that important? Because you see, Christ has been raised from the dead and he lives in the spiritual realm. The heavenlies. You and I live in the spiritual realm, in the heavenlies. When we were baptized into Christ, he put... God put us in Jesus. God put his spirit inside of us. There's a united relationship with him now. And Ephesians chapter two, page two of this letter, he says in verse four, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And, verse six, watch it, verse six. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. You don't live here anymore. You live in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus, who is seated above all rule and authority. He placed you beside him, in him. God made you beside him in Christ. That's what this says. And it is so important that you and I understand that because you can't change how you see yourself, who you are, until you change your understanding of where you are. You are in Christ if you became a Christian. Verse 4, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. See, it is Christ. He is my location. Wherever I go, I am with Jesus. This is so critical. Think about this a moment. I have a very good friend. Uh, his name is Dale. We are best friends in the world. I mean, I, I told him this recently. I said, Dale, you are the very best friend I have in the whole world. And he said, I feel that same way about you. You know what the definition of a best friend is? Two guys who have a, exactly equal amount of dirt on each other. <laughs> you see, we could at any point destroy each other's life because we have been so open and transparent with each other that if I were to tell you everything about him, it would change your opinion of him. And if he told you everything about me, you probably wouldn't even listen to me right now, right? You see, we are best friends. So if I'm with him, do I behave differently than if I'm by myself? or when I'm with other people? Yes. Now, I said Dale was my best friend and I lied. I didn't mean to lie, I'm just using that as an illustration. Actually, Jesus is my best buddy. He's my best friend. He's my king, he's my brother, he's God, my savior, but he's also my friend. Now, I'm not saying that, Jesus said that. John chapter 15, he said, there's no greater love than what somebody will give his life for his friends, and you are my friends. You're no longer called servants, you're now my friends. Now, I am a servant of Christ, he is my master. That's my understanding. But also, 
He's my absolute best friend. If I remember that Jesus is with me all the time, you think I might behave differently than if I forget that Jesus is with me? Now, he's not my invisible friend that I made up. He is my invisible friend who is really there. This is so important because everywhere you go, whatever you are doing, Jesus is there. If you can remember that, will it help you face temptation better? Do you think maybe you have more power to overcome the temptations of the enemy? Do you think maybe that if you remember Jesus is with you and you're being tempted to do something wrong, say look at pornography or lie to someone or steal something, and you remember Jesus is there with you, do you think maybe you might turn to him and say, Lord, I need your help here. Help me overcome this. And you now have more power than you would before you remembered Jesus is with you. If you thought you were all alone, you may think you can get away with things. But if you remember Jesus is with you, you can turn to him for power to overcome, can't you? Not only that, if, if my friend Dale were with me and I met you and you did not know him, what would I do naturally? That's right. I would introduce you to each other because I want my friends to know each other. Because if you knew Dale like I know Dale, you would want to be his friend too. And you two may become best friends as well. Jesus is my absolute best friend and he's with me all the time. Do you think it might be natural and normal for me to introduce my best friend to some of my other friends who don't know each other? That's normal, that's natural. And I'll find a way to do that. Because you see, my best friend Jesus happens to be <laughs> the king of the universe. He happens to be the conqueror of sin and death. He has overcome death and he gives us victory over death. I don't have to be afraid to die. And if I'm not afraid to die, then I have confidence to live. And that best friend is with me all the time. So I want my other friends to meet my best friend. I'm gonna find a way to do that. How about you? And if I remember that Jesus is with me all the time and that all that he is and all that he has is now mine as well, do you think I might live differently? Absolutely, with greater confidence, with a deeper hope, with less of a feeling of helplessness and more of a feeling and understanding of power? Absolutely. So it is important to remember your location is in Jesus. Now, what difference will that make in your life? That's what I wanna ask you. You talk about with that with some friends, would you? If you've never seen this quite like this before, who can you tell this good news to this week? Who can you sit down and say, man, I can't, I can't describe to you how exciting this is. I just learned something about a, a truth, a reality in my life. See, I became a Christian, but I didn't understand that that meant that I'm in Jesus and Jesus is in me all the time. You know what that does for me? And now you're telling your friend, or you can tell them about what I said about this. And then you're not you're not put on the spot. It's not you telling them, trying to convince them. You're simply telling them my story. Because before I came to Jesus, this is my life. I was one messed up bud. I mean, I, I, I didn't have anything to offer. Really. I was, I was a sinner and I missed the mark so badly. And my life was a mess without Jesus. Now, I can't tell you I've even been perfect since I became a Christian, because that's not true either. You, when you become a Christian, or if you are a Christian, you realize this. That doesn't mean you're going to live the perfect life, never sinning again, but it does mean Jesus will keep you constantly clean and forgiven as you keep walking hand in hand with him, trusting him to always forgive. So what are the benefits from this lesson that you can find for yourself in your walk with Jesus? And do you see that this is the foundation 
of not only your identity, but your relationship with other people. That's where we're headed in this study to Ephesians. So every time we're together for the next several months, we're gonna be turning our attention to the truths that Paul teaches in the letter to the, Ephes to the Ephesian Christians. Because you see, that's our letter too. Thank you for being a part of this Bible study. Pray with me one more time, would you? Jesus, I pray that you will make this time together productive in the lives of all of us who have participated in this Bible study. Thank you for always being with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your life for us, and thank you for giving your life to us. Thank you for filling us with your power, with your spirit, with your love, with your joy, with your peace. Thank you that we can face life and death with confidence. You have given us a reason to live and a confidence to die. Thank you, Lord, for all of that. It's in your name we pray, amen.